What's happening y'all, it's your boy Keezy. It ain't easy being Keezy. And in today's video, we're gonna talk about some underappreciated streetwear brand designers that I don't hear enough people giving like homage or credit to and or just talking about anymore, period. So I'm gonna try to shed light on them today. We're gonna go through a couple of them. Let's get it. First up, we're going to talk about uh, Mark Echo, and Mark Echo is the founder of Echo Unlimited. Now to get everybody up to speed that might be newer to streetwear, or maybe they weren't around during the time that Echo was popping, Echo was a brand that came up during the time of other brands like FUBU, uh, LRG, and Academics and things like that. I mean, damn near every kid had it on. I mean, by the time I was in high school, a lot of people were still wearing Echo. It was huge. It was a huge, huge brand. A ton of rappers wore it, so thus everybody else wore it too. But why I chose to put uh, Mark Echo on this list of underappreciated streetwear slash urban uh, designers is that a lot of people forgot about Echo, right? Because there are so many brands that have happened since the early 2000s until now that can clutter you and cloud up your vision as to what the original brands were. But you get what I'm saying? Echo was definitely an originator when it came to the urban sector for men's fashion in the early 2000s. And a lot of people just don't talk about that. Maybe because uh, Mark himself, I believe, might have sold the company and moved on and then he moved on and ended up starting complex which is like the giant or the mega brand uh, for all of streetwear and sneaker culture combined i pretty much went from being the amateur kid who loved graphic art and illustration and then was doing this full to part-time illustration service and that was kind of how it became known and for those hearing this you're probably like well there's nothing like special about that because that's what people do now and yes you're absolutely right but the difference was that he was one of the first to do it and brands like echo lrg fubu academics these brands during this urban era before the economy crashed in 2009 a lot of these brands like sean john and stuff they didn't know what they were doing so to speak and the word streetwear didn't exist streetwear was not a solidified thing in fact wearing things like echo or fubu back then it was an ostracized category. I mean, people really looked at this category of clothing as if it is not fashion, like period, end of discussion, right? But, you know, in today's time, when we talk about streetwear, casual wear, things like that, you know, luxury and street fashion have combined themselves uh, so much that we almost can't even tell the difference between them anymore. I almost put money on it. A lot of people watching this right now don't even know that Mark Echo, who came from Echo Unlimited, owns Complex. Complex Magazine was actually supposed to be a blog for Echo Unlimited, but I don't know what exactly happened there, but he ended up either leaving that venture and he was like, well, we can just do this complex thing. And now complex is huge. A multi-million dollar brand that pretty much encompasses anything streetwear, anything sneaker related, period. I mean, they're, they're like the Nike of, of streetwear at this point. I mean, nobody else tops complex, period. Okay, so speaking of urban wear, the second brand I wanted to talk about is going to be Public School. Public School was started by Dao Yi Chao and Maxwell Osborne. Okay, these two individuals actually had met at Sean John, I believe, that was owned by Puffy. Uh, and this is all during the same era. And they had met working at that brand and later on had moved on to starting the brand Public School. Now, if you go online and look up anything on Public School, you're basically going to get a whole roster of all the accomplishments that Public School has achieved. And just to name a couple of them, Public School has received many honors, including the 2013 CFDA Swarovski Award for Menswear, the 2013 CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund Award, and the 2014 CFDA Menswear Designer of the Year Award, and the first International Woolmark Prize for Menswear in January 2015. For any of us to even just read that, okay, you gotta be doing crazy good, all right, to win those type of awards. I mean, how impressed were people and how inspired were people when people heard about Virgil winning like the brand of the year, designer of the year is one of those. I can't remember exactly which one it was, but it was a very high achievement. And then of course, collaborating with people like Louis Vuitton uh, and becoming the menswear designer for them. But if we think about it, Dao Yi Chao and Maxwell came from the urban wear era and then graduated and then started doing the whole streetwear thing with public school and then got scooped up by DKNY which is linked to LVMH. 
Yeah. I mean, you 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 got to put two and two together here. That is incredible. It had like a very very slight '90s feeling, but that's exactly what the inspiration was. Oh, get out, really? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly our inspiration was '90s Bedwin with this Bedwin undertone of movement and travel. It's you know like a reoccurring theme that you'll see in all of our collections about reappropriation, taking different styles and blending them into new things and that's really what the early 90s was about so anyways when it comes to public school when it comes to Dao Yi Chow Maxwell check them out I mean their credentials are pretty crazy I mean you can read and read and read they got article on article YouTube video on YouTube video online that you can go and research these guys I would definitely uh, go do your homework on them All right, so the third uh, streetwear designer I want to talk about that is pretty unappreciated is Edison Chen. Now, I'm not saying necessarily because of clot is the reason why he's underappreciated. We're not necessarily here to talk about that, but his history and footprint in streetwear is pretty massive. So to explain this correctly, if anyone remembers, in 2008, 2009, 2010, the economy pretty much went to shit. Um, if you talk about streetwear, urban wear at the time, you know, malls were closing, stores were closing, people didn't really shop online, at, you know, the same way that people shopped online in today's times. So a lot of brands were just closing down, shutting down. You didn't really hear anything from them and they didn't make that transition from the early 2000s into the 2010. So by the time the economy was just starting to pick up back up by 2013, maybe 2014, the huge financial backing to streetwear that a lot of people don't talk about is from China, okay? More specifically, extremely rich Chinese youth. Also why the timing of this is kind of funny is that China blocks out pretty much any American information to their people. It's no secret, okay? You know, they don't use Facebook, they don't use Instagram, they don't use Twitter. They have their own apps. They use, you know, Weibo, they use WeChat and things like that as their versions of Facebook. I'm sure you've heard of it by now. But since a lot of those Chinese youth, even from the 2010s, had been blocked from seeing anything that we were doing here in the States, they had really no vision as to what people were wearing during the time. And Edison Chen, from how people explained him to me that come from mainland China and understand his cultural relevance, is that this guy was basically the missing link when it came to Chinese youth and buying into sneaker culture, streetwear culture. A real person uh, is Michael Jordan. How he dressed, how he played basketball, how he tried so hard to win. Um, these were all things that I wanted to be. When I was a kid in class, I would draw Jordan jerseys. And you're probably asking yourself, well, why did they copy Edison Chen and why was he the missing link? Because he, was a celebrity in Asia, either Hong Kong or China. He was just a super mega celebrity. I don't know if he was held to the same pedestal as Kanye West, but the way people talk about him that are from mainland China that I talk to about Edison Chen, they explain his influence very similar to Kanye. It's kind of like, you know, Kanye wears something and then everybody copies him. Edison Chen wears something and then all the Chinese youth end up copying what he has on. And again, this is something that just a lot of people don't talk about or maybe because they don't know. I mean, much like Dao Yi Chao and Maxwell, Edison Chen also has a pretty huge roster as, as far as the collaborations that he's done and also his mark uh, in this street fashion world, basically. Okay, hopefully I'm ending this video with a banger. I've already made a video on this guy, but it's going to be Jonas Bavakwa. If you don't know who Jonas Bavakwa is, may he rest in peace, by the way. But Jonas Bavakwa was the owner and the original creator of LRG. It was also owned by one other person, but Jonas was pretty much the main guy. But speaking of garments, um, LRG really came out with way more than just t-shirts. I know I know when, you know, high fashion people look really kind of look down upon the whole urban wear, street wear people because all they think about is hoodies, t-shirts and hats, right? But if you think about it, LRG when they came out, it was it was beyond t-shirts, beyond hoodies, beyond hats. It's a variety of different things from flannels to hoodies, to selvage denim, to leathers. There's stuff for the golfers, for the preppies, for the skaters. You had track jackets, you had like bomber jackets, you had the denim, the denim was huge. Man, when the denim came out at a decent price point and the quality was actually pretty on point and it had a lot of detail to it, 
you know, for the male audience, it was new to us. It was connected to a lot of things that we loved. It was endorsing Kanye. They did mixtapes with people. I mean, it was a whole package that LRG was being sold and marketed uh, to the millennial generation that it, it would it just marked a, a really good time in urban wear and in streetwear. And honestly, personal perspective, I think LRG is one of the most overlooked brands and i also think the only reason lrg is not what it is today in the u.s they're still popping in japan and they're still popping in other places in the world not in the u.s really not necessarily but why they're not popping anymore is because of him passing and i think he died of natural causes i'm not sure exactly you know how he passed but if he was still alive today just imagine what lrg could have been and jonas also put together lrg as another brand that was also charting uncharted territory like people didn't necessarily know what to term lrg as besides it being a hip-hop and skate brand they'll say that we're the number one clothing line in hip-hop but like we want to be the number one clothing line you know period like that's 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 our goal. We are trying to be an American brand. Listen, America, let's stop using the word urban. They're trying to hold us back by giving us that word urban. We make clothes. We make an American brands. America is all of us. America is hip hop. But for how creative streetwear brands are becoming today in this spectrum of combining streetwear and high fashion, I can definitely imagine LRG if they had the correct marketing and if Jonah was still alive and still keeping the brand going today and probably wasn't being sold off to some major conglomerate. At that point, I put money on it that LRG would still be popping and still going crazy. And also probably would have had the opportunity to do something as big as Supreme and or mix themselves into the high fashion realm if it was still around for the Western world. We just, we just don't know. All right, so I'm gonna end off um, this video just kind of like with my, my rough thoughts on this. I really came up with this video idea pretty quickly. But today, streetwear isn't always looked down upon as much as it was in the 2000s. And I could put money on it that none of these brands or designers that I talked about here, the four designers that I talked about here today, would have ever thought that in 2020, streetwear would have gone so far that it would have blended with high fashion so much that you almost can't even tell the difference. And now streetwear is considered high fashion. What? <laughs> the, the brands that got laughed at and still are getting laughed at by the way, don't get enough credit as to how much they changed, you know, perceptions uh, and paved the way for brands to even exist today. I think I made this whole video just to say that. All right. And you know, on that note, let's converse about it in the comment section below. So I'm going to go ahead and end this video. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you guys and girls keep it locked from clothing, music to culture. It is your boy Keezy and I'm out. Peace. You want to do and it's just going to take a minute, but it's going to work out. Like, like if you try to cut corners and you put costumes on the do shit. Yeah, you just, you gonna get straight, but at what cost, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And how you feel. When you do this for you, 100% for you, you can grind and stay up for five or six days and not really be tired because it's for you. you.